Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of Enter the Scottyverse Interviews. Annalise, welcome back on the show. Thank you. I'm glad we finally been able to get down to this. I know, and congratulations. You were the first person to have two episodes on Enter the Scottyverse, so yay for that. Um, for those of you who are listening, it's, it's been a while since I've been able to do a podcast. Life gets in the way. I'm still not doing this full time because I'm not making money for this, but eventually one day I still won't be making money for this. So I'll do what I can when I can. Uh, I want to start the episode a little differently. I'm going to tell a story from this weekend. So I live in an RV park, not a trailer park. It's an RV park. Campers come and go and I just live here full time. I do a lot of front porch sitting. And while I'm doing front porch sitting, those of you who listen to the podcast know I like to drink. So I was on my front porch yesterday, just, you know, drinking, watching people come and go. And there was a lot of, there's like a hundred people here this weekend, which is a lot for this place. And they're walking past and everybody keeps like looking at me. And like, normally I'm used to somebody walking by and they'll look and they'll wave and smile. But these people are not smiling and waving. They're just like staring me down, walking past. So yesterday afternoon, the owner comes up and he's like, hey man, uh, did you not hear? It's like, did, I didn't hear what? I'm no, I've just been sitting here. He's like, yeah, so this huge group that's here is, uh, it's about 100 people all in AA. <laughs> so I had like 100 people walking past in AA and I'm out there just slamming Kerr's lights all day long. So I, I did the respectful thing and I put a cooler by the edge of the road and I wrote free beer on it and I left it out there for them if they wanted it. Uh-huh. Oh my God, that's funny. Yeah, so... That was my that was my yesterday, but Annalise, yeah, welcome back to the show. Uh, last time we talked, we were talking about your travels, and I think it's just interesting and amazing how much traveling you've done at such a young age. And the podcast went a little long last time, and we got through a lot of your South America type stuff, Central America, a lot of Africa. But today we're going to talk about Annalise in Colombia, which. I, I think Colombia, I think Pablo Escobar, and I think Shakira. That's really it. I mean, <laughs> Shakira is Colombian. Really? Yes. I didn't know that. I just Googled that. So that's the only reason why I now think of Shakira when I think of Colombia. She used to watch was like Puerto Rican or something. Nope, she's Colombian, and her hips don't lie, so. True. <laughs> so anyways, yeah. Uh, how did you get into Colombia? Let's go there. Okay, so... I was traveling with my friend Molly in Peru, right? We talked about that a little last time. I met her when we were volunteering in Zimbabwe. So when we were talking about going to Peru, I was like, yeah, fun, Machu Picchu. Molly was actually born in Colombia and then she was adopted out of there as a baby to an American family. So she had been one or two times and she had wanted to go back after Peru. And Colombia is one of those countries that has never really been on my list to travel. You know, sort of like Venezuela and North Korea. <laughs> yeah, I never really thought of it as a place to go and definitely not a safe place to go but she wanted to go and I was like shit if it's safe enough to go like let's go why not so I didn't really know anything about it except Pablo Escobar and cocaine and gang yeah. violence and that's I, I think that's so all I we all think about home. so you gotta think yeah, in, the, yeah. in, so, in the 80s all the coke was coming out of Colombia and it was a very it was a very poor country very drug driven even though Pablo Escobar was kind of like a Robin Hood, he, I'm not advocating for hard drug usage, but he put a lot of money back into the communities and was doing illegal things, but he was trying to help his country the best way he could while being a merciless human being and executing his own countrymen. Yeah, which is actually really interesting to see while I was there. Yeah. So leading up to getting there, I told my mom, she was not happy. She was like, you can't go. And then I was like, Yikes, mom, like you can't tell me what to do. I haven't lived with you for years. <laughs> like I hate to break it to you, but I'm gonna go. <laughs> yeah, you don't control me anymore, mother. I was just like, I'm sort of surprised that you, you thought you had a shot here. But yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I, yeah, that's a but, mom thing. They have to try. I mean. Have to try, have to lose. It ended up being fine. She was just like, call me every day, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, I'm probably not going to have service. Honestly, I'm going to see you in like a week and a half, or I'm not going to see you in a week and a half, but we're just going to see how things go. So, it's gonna roll <laughs> last a dice day of Peru. Um, I'm, are you frozen? Okay, can you hear me? I, I, yeah, I've heard you the whole time. Last day of Peru. Uh-oh. 
I can hear you yeah. just fine, but internet may be. You were frozen up for a second. So last time, I used my car, and we were going to go to the Verizon store and get a new one before, but ended up not happening. So long story short, card was in the back of my phone case. So now that credit card is gone. Um, I have another one, but it just has like a low balance and I can't get money out of it. So I'm like having a Venmo um, Molly and use her cash the whole time. And I end up going to a mall and getting this like super ghetto old Samsung. It's like a Samsung like J5, like we don't have it in the US. Yeah. Oh, heaven forbid there's cell phones we don't have. You know, there's a lot of things around the world that we don't have in the US. I'm just saying. But no, there's also, which, is, yeah. which is super true. But my pictures from Colombia, which I have very few because I just lost my phone. Yeah. They're straight pixelated. Looks like Minecraft. It looks like so. you're taking pictures with a potato. Yeah. yeah. My favorite country by far that I've ever gone to. Wow. So we fly to Medellin. Medellin is spelled M-E-D-E-L-L-I-N. But it's not Medellin. It's Medellin. Okay. Very important for you to know. And that is where Pablo Escobar is from. It is the second largest city in the country. And holy shit, it's actually like a really, really big city. Like it's. Okay. No, it's gorgeous. There was one time we were up in this like sushi restaurant at the top of one of these skyscrapers and three of the walls were just glass and all you could see was city. Like it was ridiculously big. So you're eating sushi in Colombia, like not, you're not getting good Colombian cuisine. You're eating sushi in Colombia. It was, a, Medellin is a very, very hip city. It's really cool. Um, it's like, it's kind of like, uh, what's the, that super, oh. Seattle. It's like the Seattle of Colombia. It's so hip. They're really progressive. Yeah. They have safe zones. You know, if you go to the safe zone in Medellin, you won't get kidnapped. It's okay. Yes. So everything is very modern, very hip. And it turns out the past five, 10 years, mm -hmm. it has gotten ridiculously safer. And I mean, like I'd meet the locals there. Yeah. And they, were, they were so funny. Um, I remember I was at a bar with some and they were like, we don't want to steal you. We love you. <laughs> we don't want to steal you. We love you. Okay. Yeah. That's a damn before, good pickup line. I know. I was like, okay. And then they offered me this drink and they were trying to like translate it. And they're like, uh, it's like water and it's coming in a shot glass. And I'm like, mm, okay. So it's, take the shot. It was not like water. Um, it, it is this, it's called Agua Diente. So I get where they got like the water translation, yeah. but is this clear liquor that is anise flavored. It's actually really good. It's like, clear Jaeger, but Ugh. that's, you don't like Jaeger? I, well, I'm not a licorice fan, so, I mean, don't get me wrong, when I was a younger man, I was like, yeah, give me some Jaeger bombs, and I would do it, but I'm not a licorice fan, so no, I don't care for Jaeger. <laughs> what was that? I said 40 hits you hard. Not 40, first of all. Thank you, child. Oh, man, the internet's crap. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, go, okay. go, go. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. So that was like the big drink that we drank there. Um, honestly, I wasn't a huge fan of any of the Colombian food. They didn't have anything. I, uh, there were some, I had a couple meals that were like good, but didn't really love the food. But right. Medellin, right? Super sick city. One day we go on a tour to, it's called Comuna 13. So it is a poor part of the city, um, similar to what you might find in like the slums of Central America or favelas of Brazil, or uh -huh. I don't know, it's Chile, I don't know. I haven't actually been to those countries. <laughs> but so we're going on the tours and to get to these places, first we go up, oh, I, shoot, I forgot what it's called. Um, so it's cable cars, okay. I almost said zip lines yeah. for cars, yeah. <laughs> Would be cool. Wasn't quite like that. So there's these cable cars that you can take over the whole city and it takes you to the top of the hill. And these communities are built up the side of the hill. So you have your, exactly what you would expect. You know, the metal or 
the concrete um, buildings all built on top of each other and not too much grind going on with them. But super cool ride, you could see over the whole city. And just to like sort of paint a picture, all of the buildings, most of the buildings are this bright red brick. Yeah, adobe, then, right? It's like adobe housing. No, it's just like this kind of like red brick. It's, it's not adobe though. Okay, so it's like a red brick house. Cool, my bad. Sorry for thinking I knew what you're talking about. I've never been to Columbia. You should go. I don't um, think I'm allowed to. Um, let's see. I wouldn't say you're military if you go. <laughs> Definitely would not. Have a repeat of Guatemala. Um, what happened that? What remember happened? when you were like, stuck in like customs and stuff and they were giving you a hot time? No. You drink too much. So funny story. When we went to Guatemala, um, he put military on his nice little thing that you do for work. And then they all, they stopped him and were asking a bunch of questions like, oh, why are you coming to Guatemala if you're in the military? And yeah. God, I don't remember that at all. I blame all the concussions, not the drinking, to be fair. I've had close to triple digit concussions. So that's, this okay. isn't the problem. It's the head wounds. <laughs> We'll allow it. All right. Anyways, we'll so I got detained in Guatemala and we got out of that. But no, Colombia. Okay. So it's so green. So green. Um, yeah. Just super jungly, super green. And then you have these beautiful red structures against it. And the weather is perfect. Medellin is nicknamed the city of eternal spring. I mean, it's 72 year round. It is incredible. Yes, I mean, I day and night. Yeah. It, amazing weather. Okay. And so we get up to um, the commuter. And so in the past years, in order to change the country around, because it had been really dangerous for the past 50, the government, and not necessarily the government, but different community programs have in the month into, shoot, I can't get that word out right, implemented implemented mm. a ton of art programs okay. so instead of, which i thought was so sick because instead of these kids um joining the cartels they were learning how to dance and paint and tell stories i know crazy. so all of the walls are covered in murals all of the walls in the city just covered in these gorgeous intricate murals and a lot of them are telling stories of um, the horrors that they had grown up with. Because I mean, it was really only the past five, 10 years. So anyone you talked to had experienced that. So you have murals commemorating victims of violence and people that had been caught in violence um, or just communities that had been shattered. Yeah. And it was really neat how they would honor their past without hiding from it. There was one area that we were at and there was this building and it was covered in this mural. I don't really remember what the mural was, but I remember it being pretty. And then there was like a Dirge and Mary statue in it. And you could see all the gun holes like in this building. Mm -hmm. So what had happened there is there had been a shootout and like 11 people um, had died and they were all, they were all like participating. They were all like the gang members and stuff, but still those were people's kids and they, it was a cycle that fed them into that. You know, there was no other options besides violence. Yes. So everyone ended up in that cycle. And so after that, they had set up this little holy space where they sanctified the area, painted over it, and the mothers would go there and pray. Um, and then there had been another area, it was like a staircase, and a kid, like a little like two or three year old kid had been caught in the crossfire and was killed. So yeah, really sad. And they took half of the staircase and converted it to slides. Like little play slides. Yeah. So the kids could play there safely in his memory as they like turn the city around. So it's like stuff like that that was just really incredible because at least in my experience, a lot of the tragedies that we've seen or that I've seen personally in the US tend to be covered up or you see a prettier angle and not really 
honoring what happened and learning from it quite as much. There was another, it was a park near the same area and this artist had put statues up all around. So I don't remember the artist's name, but they were all statues of these like really large people um, and just pretty statues. But there was one that was actually just like a giant duck, like a rubber ducky, but a little cooler. Yeah. Okay. And a few years back, it had been the site of a terrorist attack where they, um, a group had placed like thousands of pounds of explosives blown up and killed like 20 people there. So the city, after that, the city removed the statue and there are murals all around um, honoring the people that died. But the artist asked that the statue be placed back and that he would make a replica because he wanted it to have cut it out. My cat's back here trying to ruin all my lilies. She's doing a good job of it too. Um, but he wanted it, people to like remember what happened. So you had these two statues side by side one was the original and it was warped from being blown up and then you had the replica of what it looked like before and then a nice little explanation of what happened so that was the biggest like mind-blowing thing for me about Columbia is the way that they recovered yeah. from a really really terrible time in their history using art but then they didn't try to hide it Yes. They so wanted and, it to be seen. And I think that's a very like Central America type thing. They kind of, they, they remember the past, but they live in the moment. And um, they don't, they, they admit what happened and what went wrong. Like you talk to Germans about World War II and that's a very taboo subject. Um, America, the World Trade Centers got hit and they made a small memorial park and put up six other skyscrapers where they went, you know? So it is impressive that the Colombian people went and yeah, this tragedy happens, but they embraced it and they said, we're going to learn from it and we're going to put something beautiful here so that way we never forget it. Yeah. And then like the following generations can see. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so that was Camino 13. Oh, one other thing. So part of why uh, places of poverty stay in poverty is just like the cycle, you know? Um, you can't get to the richer part of the city to work because it's impossible to get there because you're walking all these million little stairs. And okay. if people that have money to bring to the community, first off, they don't want to go there because there's nothing to see. But also they can't get there because it's all these little stairs. Like there's millions of stairs and they're on like these hills, you know, like no one has time for that. So, so it's like people, a stairmaster from hell. Exactly. People end up... Um, working and living in the same little part of the city without ever going anywhere else because it was just inaccessible. Yes. So in the past couple of years, <laughs> the government actually installed escalators. Like outdoor escalators. Outdoor escalators going up um, this freaking mountain to these <laughs> communities. Like, okay, so how long of an escalator are we talking about? Are we talking like a mall, a hundred foot escalator, or are we talking like a quarter mile escalator? Um, a collection of hundred foot escalators. That's okay. So you take one escalator up, you know, you go past some little lady's house and you just kind of wave in the window as you're going up and you go and get a different escalator and keep going up. Yeah. Like a dozen okay. of them. Okay. But like you're also taking the cable cars up now. Mm -hmm. So you take the cable cars up and then you get to the area. There's like different escalators all over. It's like Disney um, World so for that poverty. So that it was actually accessible. Yeah. And so if you're not going there to showcase like the poverty and gawk at people like, oh, you're living like this. Yeah. You're there to see the art that they've always made there and okay. the different of their culture, uh, which is different from the rest of the city because obviously. Um, so you're going to see all the different little parts and learn about them. And so that has been able to bring tourists to them and more money into that part, but also allow them to leave and find better jobs and better education and make it so they're not so trapped in the situation. Mm -hmm. Also build up their community. So those communities have been able to get a lot stronger in the past couple of years with the escalators and the cable cars and tourists coming up. And so that was really cool to see. And then there's all these little street dancers too. So everyone's doing their dances in the street. 
Um, there's these guys doing some hip hop stuff. And so I love the art aspect of it, right? So that was one tour we went on. And then naturally, Medellin, you think Pablo Escobar, mm -hmm. right? So me and Molly, we wanted to learn about him and, but do it in like a not asshole way. Because uh, a strictly educational type of way. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, especially like in America and like with narcos on TV, people tend to um, like idolize him. And we know there was a lot of destruction done because of him and by him. Yes. And so there were some Pablo Escobar tours you could go on um, and the locals hated them. Yeah. It would go and they'd take you to where he was shot <laughs> and like his house and tell you like all the really cool stuff he did. And we were like, no, like that seems really culturally insensitive. We don't want to do that. Yeah. Um, but we did want to like learn about him. So we're like asking this lady who got another tour from, we're like, hey, do you do any Pablo Escobar tours? And at first she's just like, horrified she's like no no like we don't do that um and then after saying she's like actually i do know this guy um and the one he does is the only one i would ever recommend you to and he's uh, just talking to molly because i don't speak spanish also the uh, spanish is gorgeous i didn't understand any of it um in peru i was getting pretty good with the spanish colombian spanish she said it's like cleaner and purer. I don't know. Maybe I'm just used to like Mexican slang Spanish because I couldn't even understand the numbers, but it's yeah. really pretty. And also everyone in that entire country is extremely attractive. Everyone. All and right, well, yeah. if I ever need to go get me a sugar daddy, I'm going to go to Colombia. Do it, yes. I yes. mean, look at this shirt. I look like a gringo that needs a Colombian sugar daddy, so. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Cat. Go destroy some plants. All right. So, okay. So you have attractive people and beautiful art in Colombia is what I'm hearing. Yes. And beautiful greenery. So then this lady, she just, she doesn't give us much, much information. She just says, it's $30. Come back at nine in the morning. Also, all the tours, like all the Pablo Escobar tours were upwards of a hundred. So we're like, okay, what's happening here? But <laughs> all right. So we come back the next morning and we meet her and she just like, okay, just like, wait, like he'll be here in a bit. And this blacked out car rolls up. This isn't a tour bus or anything. It's just like a five seater, <laughs> right? Yeah. And the guy rolls down the window and he just like waves at us. We're like, <laughs> yeah, all right, false end. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Yeah, so we go hop in this car in Colombia with this guy and he's telling us how he works for Pablo Escobar's family. Yeah. And <laughs> So they're the ones that run this tour. And so we go pick up this German couple and it's just us four and the guy. And as we're driving, he's like telling us different stories, um, debunking a lot of the stuff that Americans think. Like he said, pretty much narcos, 80% fake. Oh yeah, like it's all Hollywooded up. They're yeah. just trying to bump up numbers and make sure people watch it and get the whole Americanized Hollywood spin of things. Not not a lot of Americans want to know the truth out there. And like I, I wrote down a question, like how old were you, were you when you were in Colombia? Nineteen. Nineteen. At nineteen, if I was in Colombia, I would not be going on a genuine Pablo Escobar tour. I would be living in bars doing horrible things. <laughs> you know? So that's but you're you're somebody that's part of the reason why I like having you on the show is you enjoy learning and actually doing cultural things while you're there and the appropriate cultural things so i don't think i would jump in a blacked out five-seater car in downtown columbia as a 19 year old girl but you've got bigger cojones than i do sister oh it gets better so oh. <laughs> he's like debunking a couple of these myths like we've all heard yeah. the one about pablo lighting a million dollars on fire to like keep his daughter warm mm -hmm. it's because they were hiding from <laughs> They have this version of the military and the police that has a funny name that I don't remember, but they were hiding from him. And he was like, obviously, he's like, he was so annoyed by that. He was like, if he lit on a fire, the police would have smelled the smoke. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, that was an obvious one that was debunked. But then he was like saying how he works for uh, Roberto Escobar, Pablo's brother, also named, known as El Osito. 
and he was um, Pablo's like accountant. He ran the money side of things. And as we're talking about this, he gets a call and he's like, oh, that's my boss. Ha ha ha. And we're just like, oh, ha, ha, yeah, what, right. Like he's yeah. calling you. Um, and then he's like, do you guys want to go meet him? And we're like, what? <laughs> we're talking about Pablo Escobar's brother or cousin, you said? Brother. <laughs> Continue, please. Yeah. So apparently they had done these tours for the past <clears throat> little bit. Um, and Roberto would use all of the money to go back into like humanitarian projects to um, help the poor, help the elderly, help the disabled. Yes. But the government kept shutting him down. I mean, they hate everything you do with Pablo, obviously. Yeah. And we'll do like the details more in a second. But they kept shutting him down. They kept saying like it wasn't allowed. And so we had to go pretty secretly, okay? So we're going up <laughs> to Roberto's house, but we can't go all the way. So we have to stay in this like super um, treed area so that the helicopters that go past can't see us. <laughs> So we're parked in this little foresty area waiting for Roberto to come out and we're sort of hiding from the government. And so Roberto comes out and I don't know what I was expecting, but he is a little 70 year old man that looks like you might meet him at the country club. I mean, he's got like one of those like fancy little hats. You know, the ones that guys wear playing golf when they're 70? Yeah, yeah, the, the big like straw hat that comes just flat brimmed all the way around, that thing. Not that. It's like if wow. you took your baseball cap and you added like another piece of fabric connecting the brim at the top. Oh, the one that pulls down like the British yeah. cabbie driver. Okay. Those oh, ones. Okay. He's in khakis and he's just like the sweet old man. And so he's like telling us some stories and um, Molly's translating because I don't speak Spanish. Um, but he's telling us about how much he loved his brother and how they grew up really poor and like dirt, dirt poor. And so it was always like a priority for Pablo to give back to the community and everything he did was to help the poor and to make life better for people. And he's like, yeah, he did like a lot of bad things, but a lot of the things that was pinned on him also wasn't by him because he was a product of the system. He didn't create it. The government was extremely corrupt before him. Yes. They did a lot of fuck shit. So a lot of the stuff that was pinned on him, he said wasn't actually him. Of course, a little biased opinion. Test, get out of here. Stop it. But so we're talking with him. I get a picture with him. And then he actually um, wrote a book. And so I buy his book. I can have that right here. So he wrote this nice little book called King of Kings. And the cool part, not only did he sign it, but check this out. He put his fingerprint in it. That is legit. You yeah, have I Pablo don't... Escobar brother signing a book and giving you his fingerprint saying, yeah, I am who the hell I say I am. Yeah. And, oh, here he is. A little picture. Oh my gosh. I need... <clears throat> yep that, he looks like somebody i would see at a golf club exactly and there was also this like wanted poster from back in the day yeah um, i actually left it with molly's stuff so she still has it but it got signed and it got his fingerprint too but it has all of his like wingmen and stuff in the bottom and yeah. then pablo and roberto are at the top and uh, they had like huge um bounties on them but they were both like equal and i was like Damn, okay. Um, so yeah, that was neat. Met Roberto Escobar and <laughs> got a picture with him. I'll talk to him for a bit. Um, and then we went on the rest of the tour. So one of the places we went and saw was Robert, or Pablo's, it was like one of his um, houses. Yeah. It was in the city. And when we got there, it's nine stories tall, right? And it is a freaking compound. I mean, the bottom, it was either four or five stories were yeah. only for security. Jesus. Okay. Yeah. So Pablo had two kids. He had a daughter and he had a son and then he had mm -hmm. his wife. And so they would live on the top and they had, they had to have that much freaking security. Yeah. And then 
this building, like seriously, just a compound. It looks pretty boring. <laughs> besides the fact that the entire outside is coated in Italian marble. So like even on his freaking compound, he's still like bougie. Yeah. Yeah. He's Donald Trumping it up. He's like, yo, what's up? I'm rich. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then there's all these posters hanging down from the building. So the building's about to be demolished. Um, we were there in November. No, we were there early December. And the demolition is planned for January. Oh. Um, because he did a lot of bad things in the government. <clears throat> gone. Yeah. And so there's all these posters um, explaining his crimes and all the atrocities that he committed that were on it to like bring awareness obviously yeah um, so we go see that i snatch a piece of the marble and it's really cool and you stole so you met pablo Escobar's brother and he stole pablo escobar's shit yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay and, um and then so we went to one of the neighborhoods he built <laughs> So um, he built this neighborhood, and it's still named after him, where he provided housing, like proper housing, for 15,000 families. And he had made um, several of these communities, yeah. um, but we went to this one, and he built it, on, and then he just gave it to the, all the people he grew up with for free. He's just like, you guys can all move in here, because they were all living like dirt floors no electricity no water anything and okay. so and well, well let me stop you real quick before we go further what what is proper housing? because we think of american proper housing but what do you what is proper housing in colombia look like so proper housing there um there were townhome style homes they had okay. actual flooring actual walls um i believe there was electricity okay yeah they, I'm pretty sure there were wires everywhere. So they had like electricity, maybe even like TV. Um, so they weren't like on the dirt, you know? Yeah, I just, like uh, yeah, actual, actual I wanted TV. to clarify that because, you know, proper housing in America is a three bedroom with two TV or 19 TVs, whatever. Okay, Whereas no. proper housing in third world countries can be a dirt floor shanty, but he actually, he gave them floors, four walls and a ceiling. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for thank you for clarifying that. We'll continue. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so in there, there's all these murals of Pablo, like on the wall. And there's this one little area um, in the town center that has this statue of like Virgin Mary. And it was Pablo's mother's favorite um, version of it that they put I there. And there's these little um, plaques all around it with prayers from the locals, um, just praying that he is safe and taken care of and all these different things. So the government has tried many times to bribe them into changing the name of their community, but they revere him there. It's like, they know like he's done bad shit, yeah. but he also like did it to help them. Mm -hmm. And so it was very, very interesting to see how good and bad coexist and yeah. how it's not like one side of the story, you know, because a lot of people yeah. um, will think like, oh, bad guys and good guys, when usually the bad guys are still doing things for what they think are good reasons. Yes. Um, and, yeah. And their reasons just don't coincide with what the grand scale slash government thinks is the right reason. So that's when they get labeled as the bad guy. Yeah, I, I said it at the beginning, he did the whole Robin Hood thing. He was breaking laws and doing terrible things. But at the same time, he was he was a philanthropist. He was putting so much money into his communities. It was ridiculous. He did way more for the Colombian people than the government ever did. Yeah, at that point in time. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the he, Colombian government's doing now. I'm not up on that. So okay. At I that point, in, <laughs> um, he still did feel the whole drug trafficking thing and lead a lot of people into that yeah. and there's a lot of innocents that were killed because of that yes. but as for the communities that he helped they held him in really high regard but they would still they wouldn't idolize him yeah they would still acknowledge the bad he did um but honor the good he did 
which again is I think a really difficult thing for people. Like you even think about American politics. People will pick yes. the person they like and they only see the good and they want to do that. And yep. it's really important to be able to do both. Um, so we go in these communities and see a bunch of stuff. And so that was really neat. And what else was in Medellin? I feel like there was one other like important thing in Medellin before I moved to the next town. I don't know, I wasn't there. I'll come but back now, to it if I think. Yeah, it, but, that's the way this thing goes. Come back to it anytime you want. All right. So how many well, how many days did you spend there? Like like ten days, I wanna say. Maybe you're, in Medellin, you, you're in Medellin for ten days. Oh no, we were in Medellin for like two or three days. Okay, okay. I just uh, so you're in Colombia for about ten days. Medellin for two or three days. So within two or three days, you got to go see some awesome art. You got to see the greenery. You got to go on the Disney tour, Disney World oh. tour. You, you remembered it? Yes. So we did okay. a little tour outside the city. Um, it was like a thirty or hour drive or something to this cute little town. And in this cute little town, there's a giant rock mountain thing. Just like you have all the land, right? And then you have this giant freaking just rock okay. mountain just sticking out of it. Um, the story behind it was this dad left his seven sons all of his land and the youngest son, his land was just this giant freaking rock and all the brothers were like, huh, that freaking sucks. Like, what are you gonna do with this giant rock? You can't grow anything on it. You can't walk on it. Like you can't do anything. He ends up um, building all these stairs. I mean, this thing is really big. We'll have to get a picture and post it on here. Do you remember the name of it? I'll find it. It right. literally translates to like giant rock or something. Um, it won't be hard to find. But so he adds all these stairs and becomes a tourist attraction. So we go all the way to the top and you can see all around um, this town. So that's like a popular attraction. But then we go out to, um, in the same town, this beautiful lake. Can't remember okay. the name of the lake but it is freaking gorgeous. Um, all around, you see these really pretty modern houses, um, you know, like the modernistic design, where it's all like blocky and stuff. It's like that, you have a couple cottage types and then all these little vineyards. And so while we're on this lake, we're going to one of Pablo's old mansions. So he bought, this little part of the lake, he bought like all the different mansions around it so that him and his family could all live there. And so we go to this one and hmm. this mansion specifically is where he kept all of his exotic plants. So he had a zoo where he kept all of his exotic animals. Mm -hmm. uh, Necropolis is what it was called. And the government ended up blowing and he had this giant like statue dinosaurs the government blew up because they thought drugs were in them, but there weren't. Um, ah. That was like his favorite place ever. Yeah, his brother was telling us about that. But this house that we were going to is where he kept all of his exotic plants. So while we're there, we're seeing all these different plants. I mean, there's Australian cork trees. There are eucalyptus plants. There's a special kind of palm tree from Chile. There's a friggin' bonsai tree from Japan. And everything grows in Colombia. So all these like, super exotic plants are just growing there naturally. And um, he only lived there like a couple times, you know. Yeah. You're a billionaire. You have your vacation homes. But how we built this house was it had dual walls because, of course, he expected to be bombed at some point. So when the government bombed him, there was the normal wall and then another brick wall. So they only got through one wall. And yeah. it was totally fine. <laughs> but we got to like walk inside the house. Yeah. yeah. There was like this sweet little pool and there this like really cool like watchtower. That was like a spiral staircase. Oh, hi. Ah, cat. So uh, was the, was a tour of the house like a regular tour or was this because of the $30, I'm going to steal Pablo Escobar's shit tour? That one. Yeah. We just showed up and we just walked around it and we went through it. I don't think it's like regulated or anything. We just sort of just went. Okay, so it's just like an open tour. It's like a historical landmark type of thing. No, I think it may have just been like trespassing or something. <laughs> but like, <laughs> I don't know. Oh my God. <laughs> His family probably owned it, so. Uh, so did Roberto give you permission to go there? Or is it like, 
probs. We were working with this guy. So So this guy took you all the way out there is what you're saying. This three hour car ride in a blacked out five seater with two German people. Wait, let me think. Yeah, go ahead and think. While you're thinking, all right, everybody, um, she's thinking about the story. So the giant rock she's talking about is called the Rock of Guatape, G-U-A-T-A-P-E, also known as El Peñón de Guape. That's the rock she's talking about. I got pictures pulled. I'm rocking dual screens now. I'm getting fancy. I I got dual screens. So, yeah, this thing's massive. It raises to... Let's see. Blah, 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 blah. I just had it. It goes about... The landform of this gigantic rock remnant that has resisted weathering and erosion likely as a result of being less fractured than the surrounding bedrock. Pinion de Guape is an outcrop of Antigua Bathala, I can't speak Spanish, and towers up to 200 meters, 656 feet above its base. So it's a little over 650 feet high. Visitors can, yeah, visitors can scale the rock out via staircase built into one side. A path includes more than 649 steps to the top. It was quite the track. Yeah, that, I can see the picture over here, and it looks like quite the trick. But um, yeah, so so thirty bucks gets you to meet Pablo Escobar's brother. You get okay, to I actually remember the details of the story. All right, this cool. Was, there now. <laughs> different tour. This was not the Pablo tour anymore. This was the tour where we went and saw the rock. So mm-hmm. going and seeing his house was actually part of a different tour, and okay. it may have just been like open to the public or it was just owned, owned by no one. Gotcha. But we went and we walked through and there's this little paintball area that you could go and because of course like his minions like paintballing naturally I guess. So we went and saw their little paintball area and we'll have to add pictures of like that house too because the guy had some taste. Like it was sick. Um, so that was cool. And then the next day we go out to Salento. So Salento is supposed to be a six hour bus ride, right? Yeah. Um, as we and Molly are leaving the hostel, I'm like checking out. And as I'm checking out, I meet this super cool dude, David. And he's checking out with this girl and they have just met. Um, so I'm like talking Ooh. to them in the lobby a little bit. David and the girl, and huh? Huh? <laughs> Caddy is her name. Okay. So her name is Caddy. And so I'm like talking to them. And then as we get to the bus stop, they're on our bus. So we're like, what's up? So we're hanging out with these guys for what turns into an eight to 10 hour bus ride. It's naturally Colombian traffic. It's like dead stop traffic for a bit. Um, beautiful landscape though. So pretty. I wish I actually had pictures and videos and stuff of it, but I don't. Um, but super gorgeous. We get out to Salento. Salento is a small little town, eight out, six eight hours outside of Medellin, and it is home to Valle de Cacora, which is where you can find the tallest palm trees in the world. Uh, now, these palm trees are, I want to say six or eight stories tall, so they're freaking ridiculous. That's, yeah. 60, to, that's 60 to 80 feet. A story is generally like 10 feet. Yeah. So that's like a, a 60 to 80 foot palm tree? They're really big. Jimmy Buffett would lose his mind. <laughs> we'll have to add pictures of those. <laughs> okay. It was crazy. So um, we get to Salento and oh my God, I'm like itching my ankles so bad. I stood in uh, Ant Hill a couple days ago. Why would you just stand in an Ant Hill? <laughs> I didn't find out because they were all over me. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Anyways, all right, so giant palm trees, Salento. Forget about the ant bites. Get to Salento, and also it's December, so... Oh! Oh, okay, sorry. I'm going to oh. have to backtrack here real fast. It's go December, ahead. So we go, while we're in Medellin, we go on this Christmas tree tour, or Christmas light. So there's okay. this little, like, festival that you can go to. And, I mean, there's, like, different, like, carnival rides... And the lights set up for Christmas are freaking ridiculous. And it's crazy because we're not seeing any snowman. We're not seeing Santa Claus or like what we would expect, like a nativity or anything like that. We're seeing giant lights that are in the shape of flowers and lizards and frogs and birds. 
and yeah. just gorgeous and so colorful and there's like lily pads and these things are all like towering over us these are like 20 30 feet art installations and you're going all around the park seeing these there's like food vendors um rides for little kids so that was really cool it was really cool to see like columbia in christmas time and it was so not what i expected um really pretty would recommend okay so back to salento so we get there the city center um i think it actually had a, like a little nativity that was like the only spot i saw like a little nativity Okay. And then, so you have the little square of the center, and then there's four streets leading off. And the one street that our hostel is on, it has um, palm trees, just like made out of lights, and just leading down, right? Because um, it said like pine trees for Christmas, it's palm trees, obviously, if you're not in <laughs> some of the pine trees. I mean, that's kind of so a geographical really thing, pretty. you use what you have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but like yeah. that... For some reason, I just didn't expect it, you know? Just yeah, so used to pine trees, I was like surprised with the palm trees. I've um, seen people actually stack rocks and put lights around the rocks because there's no trees. In the middle of the desert, they don't have trees really. So they just literally stacked up rocks to make their little tree and they put lights around it. <laughs> that's cute. I don't know if it was cute. I was like, oh, that's interesting, but it doesn't smell like a pine tree, so. <laughs> but. Uh -oh. So we're at, because I mean, after eight hours on the bus, we're all like good friends. And that's one of the really awesome parts about traveling. You just make friends and you travel and you become best friends for a couple of days. And so we're all hanging out together and there's one, probably like the next day. Okay, first, I remember this. So there is this Colombian game called Tejo. And we're still in Salento at this point, right? Um, David is telling us about it, and so we find the little Tejo place so we can play the game. Okay. So how the game is set up, you have a little stand, um, sort of like the one that you throw hacky sacks at, you know? Yeah. To like get it in the... That's shape, but it's clay. There's a metal ring in the middle, and on the metal ring you have little flag, like little paper footballs full of gunpowder. And then you have these metal discs. Um, they're not like perfectly shaped. They're just like a chunk of metal in sort of a circle. Yeah. And so the object is the, of the game is you take the metal thing and you throw it and it hits a football and explodes. So. Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking at pictures right now and it's, this looks insane. Yeah, and you have to be drinking. They'll kick you out if you're not drinking. So we're all just drinking, having a good time, throwing these chunks of metal, trying to hit it and make the explosions. It's actually a lot harder than you would think. Um, and then at points we're like getting bored because we suck. And so it's like, we're just hitting the little explosive footballs with, um, there's this metal, it's like a metal rod with like a flat piece on the end that you use to like pound out the clay to make it smooth. And you can yes. just hit the suckers with it. Oh, they explode. They explode. It's loud. Obviously, it's like gunshots. So that's really fun. And then midnight comes. And the entire city or entire village goes to sleep at midnight. Not what I was expecting. Yeah. Like all the restaurants are closed. Everyone just sleeps instantly. We're just like, okay. Well, that's weird. Um, now to explain the characters a little bit here, okay? David reminds me of you a lot. Oh, Caddy, all of Yeah, like a lot. So very outgoing, very down for anything. That's um, not me at all. I'm very reserved and very humble, thank you. Yeah. And Kathy, <laughs> she is fun. She is, she's not the one to go get herself in trouble. Mm. Yes, so. And me, naturally, I'm down for whatever. So we're all hanging out back at the hostel thinking like, okay, it's 12, what are we gonna do? Like, we're not tired, but the entire city is shut down. And I think Molly was doing some work or something. So she wasn't with us anymore, um, but we're hanging out in the back of the hostel and all the buildings here have those really cool clay tile rooftops. You know, the ones that like stack together like this. Yeah. And like, how cool would it be if we ran along all of the rooftops? Like, I've always wanted to do that. I know you've always wanted to do that. 
And Caddy's like, what? No, like we can't run on the rooftops. And David's like, hell yeah. So God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So me and him like hop up on the roof and these things are a lot more fragile than you would think. Yes. You know? So like it's as not- soon as we get up there, it's apparent that you can't run on those. So we were actually like on our hands and knees trying to like crawl along and try not to break anything because it's only clay, you know? It's like breaking a piece of pottery and, but not even glazed pottery. And yeah. So we're, <laughs> yeah, so we're crawling along and there's this one part where we have to crawl into the next building. And so we're here, the next building has like a three foot overhang. So we're trying to like climb up there without breaking it. Anyway, it's this whole experience and we are drunk and Caddy is on the bottom. She helped us like hoist ourselves onto the roof. And so we're crawling around, just having a good old time, trying not to break the roof. And at some point, David sticks his arm through it. <laughs> we're like, shit. So once we broke the roof, we were like, oh shit, like we need to get off this roof. <laughs> so yeah, so it, it took you until you broke the roof to realize, okay, I'm gonna go run across clay topped roofs you get up there and you're like, oh, I can't actually run. So I'm going to crawl on this thing on my hands and knees. And that, that wasn't your first indication that maybe that wasn't the best idea. Of course it wasn't the best idea, but you had to wait until the dude's arm went through. So somebody's probably sleeping in this room below you. And this arm just comes through the ceiling, like, (laughs) and all they hear is people laughing themselves to death above their heads. That's exactly what we're thinking, yeah. We later find out it was just a little storage area. And when we left, we left the hostel lady a bunch of extra cash to cover it. Or when she found out that it was broken. I, I, at least you were nice enough to say, hey, we broke your roof, here's, here's 20 bucks. Yeah, yeah. So we did leave her money. Um, okay. We get down from the roof and Patty's like, oh my God, guys, you like broke the freaking roof, what the heck? Um, and we were just like, yeah, shit, like that did happen. <laughs> um, and then me and David are still like, just like wired, like, okay, like we don't want to go to bed. Yeah. And so we're just running around the town and following us. And there is a certain privilege about being an American in a South American country, especially <laughs> Colombia, because were we to get in trouble, all we have to do is bribe them. And yeah. really, the bad publicity for putting an American in jail protects us anyway. Oh, yeah. So, sorry, we're not going to get in trouble because we're American and we're there bringing money to the economy. And that's terrible. Like, we know, like, it's bad. I was 19. <laughs> I'm 19. I have $30 in my wallet and I'm an American. I ain't going to jail tonight. Let's go murder somebody. Pretty much, yeah. And we're like, oh, what are they going to do? Throw us in Colombian jail? (laughs) Actually, it was so bad. That would have been terrible. That's because it's like, yeah, probably. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so these cops are following us. It's like two in the morning, and they're like, what the heck? Like, everyone in the city is asleep. And then we start running away from them, and we go through the jungle and lose them. And there's like a little path between these houses. And so we lose them. Are you running through a jungle or are you running through people's backyards that look like a jungle? It's the backyards that look like a jungle. All right. (laughs) So. (laughs) Jesus Christ. Backyards. Okay. And then we come across a little cemetery. So naturally, the only option is to break into the cemetery. (laughs) So we jump the fence and we're hanging out in the cemetery. And just looking at all the different graves and stuff, just having a good time. <laughs> yeah, and so. So, two in the morning, drunk in Columbia, breaking into cemetery and admiring gravestones. Yeah. Like, what, okay, so when you say break into a cemetery, like, did you have bolt cutters yeah. and you had to cut a lock or did you jump a fence? No, we just jumped a fence. We didn't okay. hurt anything. All right. So you were trespassing. Yeah. You didn't actually do a B and E. Yes, yes. I'm actually not as cool as I was thinking. Uh, but you met Pablo Escobar's brother. You're cooler than I'm ever going to be. <laughs> yeah, so we took the fence. At some point, we're like, okay, there's not shit to do in this town anymore. Um, so we go back. And 
at some point we just go to bed. So the next day, Molly's there's doing- not, Wait, wait, wait. So there's not shit to, we, we crawled across the rooftops, created damage for the hostel that we're staying in. We ran away from the Colombian police. We went through a whole bunch of backyards that looked like a jungle. We broke into a cemetery and admired gravestones. I think we've kind of tapped it out. That's the, oh, after throwing pieces of steel at little footballs filled with gunpowder. It was so such you, a fun day. So you, oh my gosh, I spent four hours at night in this town and this is all I get? What was me? <laughs> Jeez, and girl. Ran out of the Agua Diente, which yes. is another factor there. I still have I, some of them somewhere. Apparently that is the... Uh, national drink of Colombia. I've been doing a little bit of reading on the side here. Oh, yeah. That makes I can't. Sense. I don't know exactly. What, it's made out of sugar, and it's a malt liquor. Is all it says. Yeah. So and, you want to get one yeah. without sugar? It's better. You don't get hungover. Yeah. Twenty-nine percent alcohol by volume, and it says there's a lot of different versions, but it's also it's usually classified just as fire water is what they call it. So. Anyways. Yeah, so, so when they told me it was like water, you forgot to mention the fire part. All right, so you but, get you get done with David trespassing in a cemetery in Colombia. Yes. So the next day Molly is working and I go out with the other two to Valle de Cacora. So we take a Jeep out there and we're like standing on the back and I mean the scenery is incredible. The, I wish I had some pictures here, but I don't. Um, but it's just like rolling hills and various greenery and wonderful palm trees and just gorgeous. So we get out there and um, we ask like these guys like, oh, which is like the shortest way to get up? Cause it's like a four or five mile trail to like go around the whole thing. And so they point us up one way and we're like, are you serious? Oh no, I just froze. Oh, no, Annalise, if you can hear me, I'm choppy. Wait one second, please. It's like, it's like straight up this hill. So we go, and holy shit, it was a tr Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah you said uh, the shortest distance. They point you guys one way. Yes. So we're going this way, and it is so freaking steep. Like, we're going straight up this hill. I mean, the horses can't make it up this hill. Also, there's horses all around. We're in like this little horse field. Um, the horses can't make it up this hill because it's so steep, so we're dying. And one of the two, I think, I think it was David is just freaking running up this thing and like me and Caddy are behind like dead. We make it up the hill and I don't know, it's really hard, but apparently it was a shortcut. And so we're just looking around at the trees, taking some pictures and David, he says something about how this is the perfect place to find shrooms because of the weather and because it's in a horse pasture. So we start looking for shrooms <laughs> and we actually find a couple. Um, oh, you, so wait, 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 you, you do know that your parents listen to this, right? I'm just They'll saying. Be okay. <laughs> All right. I just, I wanted to throw that caveat out there that I've spoken to them and one of them has even, he's gotten after me for, not having a podcast recently, but all right, so. Wait, what? Did my parents listen to the last one? Yes. It's <laughs> funny. At least half of them, half of your parents listen to the last one. Um, so, well, all right, so you're in Colombia. Neither of them texted me. Now, well, I guess I guess they understand that you're growing up and you're a young woman now, and they can't control you, especially after the last episode. After, do, yeah. do your do your parents know this story yet? Okay. No. <laughs> I'm gonna get a phone call later. All right, cool. Um, so you you went out, you partied all night, you broke into a cemetery, you hiked a mountain, and now you found magic mushrooms in a horse pasture. Yeah, but it's okay. getting late in the day. So how it works with mushrooms is they like sprout up in the morning and then in like once you get around like twelve, they're all disappeared. So we find like a couple, but then it's too late and we can't find any more. 
So we're going down this little trail, just hanging out, looking at all the cool trees. And all the signs are in Spanish, right? See. So there's these signs point in different places. And we know that there's one area where there's a shit ton of hummingbirds. And you can go and like the hummingbirds will come like sit on you. And there's another place where there's a waterfall. And there's, there's a couple different really, really cool things you want to see. But none of us speak Spanish. So all these signs are useless. And we don't have cell service, so we can't translate it anyway. Um, and so while we're walking, these signs are pointing different places. And one is pointing, and honestly, I think the sign has been through some stuff too, because they're not even like pointing like where the trails are going. <laughs> the, the signs are seeing some shit, guys, all right? <laughs> yeah. So we're like Alice in Wonderland. Like, like it doesn't matter where we go. We don't know where we want to go. But there is this little trail that is fenced off, and it's rest if I had a little. Oh no. Oh, my internet's messing up again. Annalise, I'm sorry. My ghetto internet. It's locked right here. Are you frozen again? Yeah, I heard the trail was fenced off. I'm sorry. Okay, so the trail is fenced off and David wants to go see what it leads to. Yeah, blame it and on it David. Like David wanted to go see it. <laughs> yeah. So it looks like it's going up to like the top of the hill and we're like, oh, maybe we can just like go up there and see, see what we can see. And Caddy's like, uh, no, we, we shouldn't jump this fence and go see what we can see. I'm like, we should go see what we can see. So we go see what we can see. So we go... <laughs> We find a little area where the fence is broken and we go around it and we go up this little trail. And we get to the top and it just has like a little field and there's not much going on. And also, so we're in Valley de Cacora, there's palm trees everywhere. We're in this trail, but on the inside, it's just all jungle, okay? So when we get to the top of this pasture, it opens up to like a little meadow or some shit, and then it's just jungle all around. So. David's like, we should go into the jungle. And Caddy's like, uh, no, we should go in the jungle. And I'm like, mm. well, the jungle yeah. seems like a good option at the moment. I'm like, I'm like, okay, the jungle will be fun, but Caddy's got a point. There's no trails. So like, if we go in, we have no way to make our way out. So we're like trying to talk down David, like, dude, we're, we shouldn't get lost in the jungle. And so we finally agree that if there were a path or if we had a guide, it would be a good idea. However, since there's none, it's a bad idea. Just as we all come to that conclusion, we find a little trail. So now we're all like, all right, full send, Caddy, you screwed yourself. <laughs> Game um, on. Huh? Yeah, we both terrified of spiders. So David goes first and then I go second, she goes next. So we're going down this little trail. By trail, I mean a slight, probably game trail. We have to duck under all these branches and like squat down and stuff. There obviously is not many humans that use this trail. Yeah. So we're going around and there's so many cool different plants and we see like these super like bright like purple mushrooms that are like this big and we're like picking all these different things. We're like, oh, we're going to um, ask like our hostel lady if these are edible and we're gonna make them with dinner tonight and we're planning this like elaborate meal. Um, and then, yeah, so we're just having a good time going through this jungle and the trail gets less and less sure of itself. So the trail goes from being a little trail to us just finding openings in trees. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, so we're just getting pretty deep, deep in the Colombian, um, jungle here and well how, how long would you say you walked into this trail slash holes and trees so we're about two hours deep okay so you're probably let's be realistic if you're on a good trail you're probably doing four miles an hour if you're on a game trail you guys are probably four to five miles from this little clearing that is past a fence that you weren't supposed to go past yes okay but we're feeling like privileged Americans. We know how to play the game here. <laughs> you got 30 bucks in your pocket. Nobody can stop you. I got it. Yeah, exactly. And so we're going okay. through and there's not really a trail anymore. And we come to a couple openings that have a lot of like hoof prints. 
And then we sort of realize we're like, oh shit, guys, we're in the Colombian jungle. We're ob- we're not supposed to be here. <laughs> what happens in the Colombian jungle? And we're like, oh shit. That's where like the drug cartels go and do all their business. And we're like, oh shit. Why are there all these horse prints? Because they're obviously not doing tours up here. And we're just like, oh shit. Like if we run into people, they're probably going to want to murder us. This This is is either the best foreshadowing or the biggest tease I've ever had in my life. So. That's just how we're feeling about the moment. (laughs) Oh man. At this point, we are lost and the fog is rolling in because every day around this time, the fog rolls in. Taz, please go away a couple minutes. And so the fog is coming in pretty thick and we can't really see where anything is. We're following the sound of the river because we know that the river at some point not meets the trail (laughs) so we're just following the sound of the river and yeah and they even david at this point is like okay like we're lost let's just turn around and retrace our steps and get out of here and i'm like yeah no like we're that's a waste of time like we've already seen all that stuff like that's we can hear the river like let's just keep going forward (laughs) I don't but want to go see what I've already first. seen. I want to go somewhere new that I'm not a thousand percent sure is going to be where I need to go. But it's a river. What could go wrong? Exactly. So. Jesus. It's getting a very, and now we're going like downhill a little bit and the trees are very close together. So mm-hmm. we have like this one side and we're like, we really can't navigate what's here, but it looks like we're going to get there and get to a cliff. That's what we feel like is going to happen. So we're like, okay, like, let's go this other side. So as we're trying to figure out what to do, um, we're like walking through and we see this Colombian guy with a machete on one hip and a gun on the other. And we're all like, shit. Like a pistol, shotgun, rifle, what type of gun? Just like a handgun. Okay. Yeah. And so we all just like freeze and like we like back up and we like talk about like, okay, like what's our game plan here? And we're like, okay, we're just going to play like the lost American tourist card. Like, oh, we didn't know we weren't supposed to be here. We must have taken a wrong turn somewhere. You know, like, so sorry, please don't murder us. Like, yeah. And at this point, like the guy has seen us. So there's no way for us to just like sneak away. And we're like, okay, this guy could like work with some cartel or something. And we're just going to play this game. Oh, also we have this bag of mushrooms in the back in his backpack and we're in like some national park or something. So you're not allowed to take any of the nature. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So we have to take that out and like hide it somewhere. Cause we're not trying to go through that or- ordeal. And so we do that. And then Caddy, cause she's the nice sweet one. <laughs> she goes and tries to like talk to this guy and he just like starts laughing at us and Turns out he was not with the cartel or anything. He just worked there, but it scared the shit out of us for a second. So he points us to like an area where we can sort of come down. So we are on a cliff at this point. Not a, not a big cliff. It's only like a 20, 30 foot drop. Oh, that's it. Okay. And yeah. So we're like, oh my God, how do we get down here? And I'm just like, okay, y'all have seen Tarzan, right? Oh my God. <laughs> so, it's my bright idea. Oh, and the worst part was, I'm wearing all white. Like, Caddy's <laughs> wearing all black, so she's good. Well, my outfit's trashed at this point. Um, and so, David, like, swings down this cliff, and we're like, um, we're like, go between, like, swinging and, like, sliding down. And so, I go to do my turn, and my feet get caught on this vine. So, you can just imagine. I'm going to draw a little picture here, okay? We have the little cliff here. This is the top. This is where I am. We have the cliff and well, okay. The well, you can't you can't just do hand motion because a lot of my people are listeners only. So you got to use your words. Ah, shit. Okay, so you have the trail on the ground. That's not where we are. We are thirty feet above that on a plateau of dirt. Okay. A plateau and- of dirt. Why did you get so suave when you said that? It's a plateau of dirt. <laughs> because I was very proud of thinking of a good synonym there. Oh my god! All right. Continue, I'm sorry. And so we're like trying to climb down using these vines and stuff. As I'm going, my feet get hooked. So now I'm holding onto a vine 
my feet are hooked behind me and I'm in a complete bridge. I'm just swinging here. I'm just like, oh shit, like I am stuck. And they're both at the bottom like, we don't know how to help you. And everyone's like, I don't know how to help me either. You know, so lots of scary stuff happened there. I ended up pulling myself back and sort of just fell down. I'm just like, okay, I'm just gonna sort of tuck and roll and make it down. So I'm just gonna that. let go. I'm just gonna let go of this vine and scream, Jesus, take the wheel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like there was no good solution here. <laughs> so yeah. We could have come up with like a good plan. So I was like, whatever, you know. Um, so just slid down and this guy is laughing at us. I guess he I don't even know what he was doing. Maybe he I think he sort of worked there. Yeah. Um, but he didn't get mad at us or anything. Um I guess Columbia is pretty chill. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we found the trail and we were actually closer to the beginning than we were when we started. So somehow we went in a complete circle. We did not see the hummingbirds. We did not see the waterfall. We did not see the cute little bridge we wanted to see. We just ended up back at the beginning and. Yeah, but I mean, you got to go and find some, some mushrooms that you couldn't eat because it was past noon and they were shriveled up. You found some giant mushrooms. Oh. No, no, no. Those, so those mushrooms were good because afternoon all the other mushrooms disappear. But if you pick them before, then like they're they those they're fine. They hold. Oh, them. so you picked the magic mushrooms before lunch? Yeah, so we picked them before, so those mushrooms were fine. But we couldn't find more <laughs> mushrooms because they had disappeared. But so were you guys tripping on mushrooms the whole time you did this? No, no. They said we should. Yeah, well, I'm glad you weren't tripping mushrooms walking through the Colombian jungle. jungle. Yeah. <laughs> I think a wild stuff. See, and, wanted... uh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> but no, it turned out we had a couple, so didn't really get. <laughs> yes. So wait, wait, wait. Did we you didn't just have say enough you... mushrooms for a proper dose anyway. Um, but you did eat a couple of little mushrooms before, but before walk. You, okay, so you, so we make it back okay. and Molly was a little bit like, well, what took you guys? No, no, no. After we were out of the jungle. Okay. They okay. wouldn't let me eat the mushrooms while we were in the jungle because we were lost. In the <laughs> I think the internet's got a delay right now. Let's give it a second and see what happens. And we were, we were, I mean, like how we were going to survive of the night like we did how long have we, we been on here um we're pushing about an hour right now but i'm having such a good conversation that you're kind of the only person that i'll talk to for longer than an hour because it's just so for at least for me it's so damn riveting that i love these stories so <laughs> Although we may have just lost internet because it's getting really choppy. Uh oh. Sorry, listeners. It is taking up more of your time. We're not done yet. Uh, so I don't, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you right now. You're frozen on my screen, but... You should totally, like, crop this whole, like, two minutes out. No, 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 no. That's what makes my podcast you know part of what my about? podcast is. No, no. I mean, I have an can editor. Yes, I can hear you. And you're moving again. You mean your daughter? Is your daughter the editor? No. Uh, my really good friend, Bill Baker from Woken Baked Podcast, is my editor. He's been podcasting for a while. He is out of, I don't know how to say the word properly, so I'll just say Key Lime Peninsula, Alaska. You guys should go give Woken Baked a listen anytime you get a chance. There you go. There's a plug right there. All right. Also, um, I will be dropping a blog here in the next month. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. We will. Let's plug the hell out of that at the end. Oh, we definitely will. Yeah. I'm still working on the game here, but I'm going to have a lot of traveling stories out there. Cool stuff. I'm also going on an RV trip for like three months at the beginning of the new year. So there's okay. going to be a lot of cool stuff. Well, if you oh. come through my neck of the woods, stop and let's have a beer. Oh, 
I definitely will. Or 17. Okay. It's <laughs> Maybe 23? What's that? I said maybe 23? Yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what we get to. All right, so... Okay. So you're closer to the trailhead. You ha- you got mushrooms after you came out of being lost in the Colombian jungle. That's kind of where I'm at right now. Yes. Okay. So we <laughs> take a deep ride back. We find Molly. She's dancing with some Colombian guy. Um, pretty much anytime I lose Molly, I find her doing the salsa somewhere. Oh. So she's nighttime now. We have were hours past when she expected us to be back. She was a little concerned, but like it was fine. Um, Cause she was doing this also with a Colombian guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, we have fun, whatever. And then the next day we go to a coffee tour. So as you know, a lot of coffee comes out of Colombia. Mm. So we go in on this nice little coffee tour and we find, did you know that coffee beans grow in berries? Yes. I didn't. There's, there are these little red berries. I, <laughs> I did an entire college class only talking about coffee. So I, I know quite a bit about coffee. They had an entire college class just about coffee. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, I don't remember what course it was, but I was able to bullshit my way through eight weeks of only talking about coffee. All this right. is like, this is like a humanity. This is like a humanities class or some shit. I don't remember, but I was like, "Oh yeah, I like coffee." So I chose coffee, and I talked about coffee for eight weeks, and I got an A. So, hell yeah! All right. Yep. So we learned a lot about coffee. <laughs> um, super gorgeous area. Um, drank some coffee there, and picked some coffee beans, and learned all about coffee. And then after that, I think <clears> that was our last day in Salento. So we head out of Salento, back onto, actually, no, we took a flight. We took a flight to Bogota, and we said bye to our new friends. And actually, David had his little, um, what are those little cameras that you can, like, take and you, like, put them on your helmet? The GoPros? <clears throat> Oh man, my internet's being bad right now. I'm sorry. Jeez. So I don't I don't know who's talking over who right now, but my internet's being really bad. <laughs> oh no. This might be the end of the episode. I wish you guys, I don't, I don't know who's talking or who's hearing what, but I wish you guys could hear what I'm hearing because it sounds like somebody just plucking strings on a guitar terribly. Yeah. Annalise, I... <clears throat> oh, I can't hear anything right now. Let's, let's both just stop talking. Um, so, we Wow, this is bad. Oh, no! Oh, she's gone. She dropped from the call, and I don't know if it's her or me. I'm assuming it's me because that's the way my life goes. I'm going to try to invite her back real back. I'm sorry, everybody. That was going so good. Oh, yeah, you're back. You're back? Okay. So I'm sorry. I think it's my internet. I I guess I need to pay the 40 bucks a month to have internet proper. Um, Man, last thing I heard was David had the hel- the camera that goes on your helmet, which I'm assuming is a GoPro. Yes, it is a GoPro. I was just okay. saying that while we were in the forest, we were like videoing this whole thing and we could have made like, a, we were planning making a super cool video with it and that never happened. So I need to message him because that'd be so sick. Yes, um, we need to get this on YouTube. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, and then after that, we went back. We found Molly salsing with some guy. We had a good meal. And, and then you went to Bogota. Day, we flew to Bogota. Molly had a friend that she knew there who um, ran like this really big hotel train there. So he right. paid for us to stay in like this really cool like master suite the night last night <laughs> and she, when she was just like hanging out with him so i went Wait, so to- so was molly just hanging out or was molly hanging out with a hotel owner who's giving you a bougie ass room molly was hanging out with them i don't know the details. <laughs> okay all right all right i'm just saying uh, i've never been to columbia but i know how the world works so <laughs> So Molly goes and hangs out with one of her old friends who happens to own this hotel chain, pays for me to stay in a really nice room, and I spend the next day just recouping from the trip and enjoying this master suite, and I go get some really bomb food, and then we fly home. And And that was Columbia for Annalise. And that was Columbia, and... My God. Like... (laughs) Me and you need to go on a vacation sometime and just see what happens. Man. So, all right. Yeah. So how about this? Like, I got four years left to my retirement. And me and you need to go just on a vacation and explore the hell out of somewhere. We should we should just pick a random ass place. Yeah, I, I think we should take like a map of the world and each just one. Throw a dart. Yes. Yeah, just throw a dart. Me, I'll throw a dart. You'll throw a dart. We'll draw a line between the two, and whatever the middle is is where we go. Okay. Okay. Or or we could each throw, like, three darts, and we just draw one winner out of the pack. It's random as shit, and we just go. I like that. Yeah, three darts each, so that gives us six kind of locations. Oh, that's going to happen, girl. We're going to go party our faces off somewhere. Random corner of Uzbekistan that we can't go to. Well, yeah, I I get that. You got to have, yes, if we throw it and it hits like Baghdad, Iraq, we're not going to go party in Baghdad, Iraq. But you don't want to go. <laughs> listen, I've partied in Baghdad, Iraq. It's not that great. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we could end up in like Saskatchewan, Canada, or God, because I'm not good at darts. If I throw a dart, that thing's going to, God no. Oh. We may end up on the moon. Yeah. <laughs> Scotty and Annalise go to the moon. Hey, that would be cool. could you imagine explaining that to NASA? Hey, NASA, um, I really need two tickets to the moon. <laughs> if you could hook that up, that'd be great. We want to talk about what's really happening on the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Because the YouTube community now knows. I know. I mean, the Earth is flat and the dark side of the Let's moon do it. is Or, I mean, like, I'm going to be RVing on Sorry, go ahead about the RV thing. It's weird that we've never went there. But I'm going to be RVing for like January through March or April. So, okay. Just do like a week trip sometime. I'm going to have a week off. Let's do it this year. Um, We could die. Sure. We can do that. Let's let's try to plan this. Um, I will look at my calendar tomorrow. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be in Hawaii for two weeks in March. And I'm going to go try to see Zach on his island. So sick. Yeah, and it's government paid. Oh, baby. I'm going to. You're going where? So Costa Rica. Nice. All right. All right. So my my internet's getting really bad. I hate to end it here because we've had such a good conversation. Um, plug the blog. If if COVID ends and I can go more than 100 miles from my house, we can try to plan a trip sometime between January and March. But plug away. Thank you for coming on the show. Say what you need to. I'll say goodbye. And we'll go ahead and stop recording. All right. Thank you guys again for listening. This is always fun. And I have to go on another trip so I can tell you all about it. But it's always nice to reminisce. And- and Columbia was incredible, so definitely go there. The flights are super cheap. Um, it's super cheap to stay there. We were paying like less than 10 bucks a night for the hostel. 
like maybe 10 bucks for a full meal if you were getting it like a nice place you could get it cheaper other places but super cheap super gorgeous the culture was amazing the people are incredible and there's lots of fun to be had there you go guys you heard it so columbia super amazing right, scotty annalise is going to have her blog coming out once she has the blog come out we'll get you a name proper I will do another interview with Annalise after Costa Rica. I, oh, a fish just jumped in the pond. I will do another interview once the blog is kind of going, so that way we can see how her RV travels go. Maybe we can turn that into a Scottyverse sub-segment, and we'll do like a weekly 30-minute episode of what happened. Um, Annalise, once again, thank you so much for being on the show. It's such a pleasure just talking with you, and it's so amazing that – the things you accomplish at 19 are so different than the things I accomplish at 19. And that's why I love having these conversations. Uh, guys, if you know anybody who you think should be on enter the Scotty verse, maybe they travel, maybe they have a hobby, maybe they have a small business. Go ahead and drop me a line, scott.shirley at yahoo.com. And I will be more than happy to reach out to these people. Cause I just want to meet people and hear amazing stories like Annalise's. And I just want to know what people are doing with their lives. Cause how many 19-year-olds do you know that have met Pablo Escobar's brother? It's insane. All right. We'll add a picture of me and him, too. And we'll talk about that in a second. So, <laughs> all right, everybody, thank you for listening. This was a great episode. Annalise, once again, thank you for being on the show. It's always a pleasure. You're welcome. Peace, Mom and Dad. <laughs>